want to jump right in this evening as we try to wrap up what we begun, began this morning. And um, we were talking about the incredible power and the pervasiveness of music in our lives, the benefits and also the potential liabilities um, to some degree. So I want to first review some of the points we went over this morning. Um, first of all, point number one. We had three points that we kind of gathered, at least we were trying to explain this morning. Uh, and first is that music is one of the most alluring, most attractive agencies through which Satan can gain control of the minds of who? Specifically of youth, perhaps of everybody, but, of, but the youth were the most impressionable. Do you remember what age it was at which youth people, anybody, forms their particular taste in music? 13, 4? Ladies and 14 for that was the peak year when it was most impactive and it followed their whole life. That was their favorite song and their favorite genre of music. And so youth, it is an empowerful agency, we are told, for good or for bad, that music is. And that was, a, that was undeniable. And we are pervaded by music everywhere. And it is, it is part of our lives. We can't escape from it and its power. And so we have to learn to use it. We talked about the hijacking of the American mind in which music was no longer... A, a profit motive, but a what motive? A control motive in which um, it is mass media, through mass media and through music that the minds no longer really, we think we have freedom of choice, but in many realities, we don't. We are programmed by what we uh, consume. And um, so we find that that's, what we listen to is determining our life. Point number two, the second major point that we looked at this morning was that music, even good music, can take the place of what? We can have like a virtual experience with God, not a real one, because it can only be found where? In the Bible. And so often music and the hype that comes with it can create in us this false sense that we have this wonderful experience with God, but when the music ends and the program's over, it's not deep and abiding because it's not based on the place where we can only find grace and help, and that is at the throne of grace where we have an experience with God's word and we find Jesus there for ourselves. It can only be found this personal experience, and so even good music can be a bad thing, right? We have to evaluate all music, but we have to value, evaluate music as a whole as far as what its impact it's having on our life. And it's, if it's replacing this, even good music can be a bad thing. And then the last thing that we were looking at was that in corporate settings where you're dealing with worship of, of God's people when they come together in corporate worship, we're dealing with something that is different than just personal preferences and, and thoughts about music, right? We, we talked about this, um, the... Uh, the smorgasbord or the potluck and how you can choose what you want when you go through potluck. But when you sit in a church service, what happens when you're sitting there and music comes? You have no choice, right? It comes at you. And so just from that analogy, we should, I was suggesting that we ought to have a different perspective of music, trying to select those that are perhaps least questionable by the vast majority of people that it would be acceptable. The Bible has a principle that um, Paul, uh, Paul talked about. He said, I have liberties, but I put my liberties at, aside when I'm dealing with other people that are weak in conscience. You remember him talking about that? And he had this principle of, of, of not necessarily even doing all that I think I'm able to do because it might offend somebody else or it might be a burden to somebody else. And so in corporate settings, we have a, like a high goal for music that we have to be careful to maintain in, in those settings because we're dealing with a different aspect than we are with just something that is in our own personal preferences. Okay, so going on tonight, this article, this, I found this interesting when I was looking at corporate uh, music when it comes to CCM or CWM. CCM stands for Contemporary Christian Music or CWM stands for Contemporary Worship Music. And these are the two genres or two types of a music that is basically pervasive in our society today. And 
as musicologists are looking at what is going on in the world, they see, and I don't know because I'm not really in it, and so I'm just taking some of their words on it, and probably there's not many, but some see that there is a trend that is going on in the CCM culture, or at least in, in, in Christendom, that is turning away from CCM. And they, they're actually calling it the demise of what is contemporary wish, worship. It's quite fascinating. It's a trend in which they are seeing a, a, a change that is taking place in Christendom. Rather interesting. I didn't really know this was going on until I was <laughs> reading a little bit about it and looking on it. And I wanted to, this is an article, 2015, by Jonathan Hayes. It was in this um, Ponder and New, it's kind of an eclectic website that has things about Buddhism, a whole bunch of stuff, and there's a section on evangelical Christianity, and there's this blog in there, and this is an article, and he, uh, this author quotes another man who gave, gives nine reasons why he thinks CCM is on its way out, and the music that is with it is on its way out, and uh, some people argue back, and they don't think it's ever going to die, and so forth, but I don't know, but I found it interesting that there is a movement, apparently, that um, deals with this, and he lists three reasons, and these are the three reasons that he gives as to why CCM is on, on its way out. First, he says that the baby boomers are losing their influence. Not spelled right, but uh, should be <laughs> there. Um, uh, the, and, and what he was arguing is that it's not the young people that are addicted and that are pushing CCM, but it's their parents. <laughs> Somebody said Amen. <laughs> Is it true that the young people actually aren't that addicted or interested in it and the parents are the ones that are vehemently, this is the music we got to have and it's pushing, but they're getting older and they're getting ready to die out and with their dying out, that music is going out. I was like, whoa. <laughs> Others acknowledge that, that it's interesting phenomena that's happening in the world. And then the second reason is that millennials are seeking old ways of doing things. This is millennials. Who are millennials? <laughs> I think that's us. <laughs> is that what somebody said? I think you're right. <laughs> Those born around the turn of the millennium, right? There's these different generations that have these different characteristics, the baby boomers and generation X and Y, and the, then the millennials came, right? And so it's the current generation that is growing up, the 20-somethings now, and teens and 20s and early 30s are this millennials. And they're actually, as a whole, there's a trend about seeking old ways. And there's a return to, believe it or not, hymns. <laughs> And this is a phenomenon that's going on in a lot of churches where they're using a lot of the old hymns. And it's not necessarily a youth movement anymore of the CCM. I thought this was quite fascinating. And then thirdly, contemporary worship is unsustainable and non-theological movement. And this would be Carl would help us out a lot if he was able to give his whole presentation. And I think he would agree with that statement. Is that true? Okay, <laughs> at least they attempt to have theological, I mean, they, they, <laughs> there's a theological issues, okay? And um, so, it, it, uh, fascinating coming from somebody who's uh, in the movement and a millennial himself that's observing what is going on around him and is gives, giving some feedback. And I want to quote one section from the article, and it said, says this, I've, as I've cited before, most millennials, and I'm one of them, by the way, grew up not knowing any other contemporary worship. In other words, the only thing they ever knew was CCM. They didn't know the old hymns. In fact, she, he, was, he was writing in there and said that um, he gets these statements all the time where somebody says, my children, I feel like, are cheated. I grew up with these great hymns, and they don't know any of them. And he said, I get a lot of these. And they don't know any of them. And we're leaving the church faster than any generation before us. Even by its own standards, i.e. the number of people in the pews, contemporary worship is a failed experiment. That was an indictment by one of their own, to some degree. I say own because, I mean, it's, we have it in our church as well. Um, but um, it's quite fascinating to me that there is a change back, perhaps, away, and maybe I think from my perspective anyway, a good change to something that is more solid, biblical-based maybe, 
that would help us out in reaching the world. Um, what is the watchword of true education? You all know it. Can you say it with me? The watchword of true education is? God aims for us to have something better. And so whatever he asks us to renounce, he offers in its place something what? Better. Now, we may not always recognize that it's something better. <laughs> we might not think that it tastes better or it sounds better, but in God's economy, it is better. We have to accept it by faith, right? Because he says it. And we will find that accepting it by faith, it will be something better. Now, um, I want to go over some points or some ideas and thoughts about, um, about this. Notice it goes on to say something better is the watchword of true education. Let the students be directed to something better than what? Display. I don't know, if from your perspective, maybe mine, that in a lot of Christian worship service, there's a whole lot of display. Is that true? I would think that's true. What about ambition? Self-indulgence. Lead them to behold the one altogether lovely. Once the gaze is fixed upon him, life finds its true what? Center. To honor Christ, to become like him, to work for him is life's highest ambition and greatest joy. This is the something better, by the way, and it is wrapped up I think, to a large extent, in how we worship and what we do, and especially when it comes to music, because it can lead us away, or we can be, we can, we can be in love with the, a virtual Jesus or the real Jesus, <laughs> with our own walk with him. Now, um, what is the, perhaps the something better at Washita Hills? Could you agree that Scripture songs is something better? <laughs> One of the reasons I like Scripture songs is because there's no genre that goes with them. We're creating the own genre, our own genre right here. You know what I mean by that? You know what a genre is? It's like a whole uh, system. It has the sound and the, and the words and the, and the beat and the music. It is, it's a type of music, right? And we're, we're, there's not, it's unique. And so it, it is based on the word of God and you're singing the word of God and what better thing there is there to sing. And so that's one of the reasons why we kind of, we shy away from so much that is out there and good or bad or whatever. We shy away and we're trying to find something better. And that's one of the reasons why we really, really, really encourage scripture songs here. It is something better. We're singing God's word and the melody is impressing those words in our heart and we can live it. And that's one of the reasons why we spend a lot of time and we really try to discourage perhaps a lot of other types when we can find something better. Because often the good is... The enemy of the, can everybody say that? The good is the enemy of the best. And we fail to receive the best because we're just satisfied with the good. So that's one of the things that we do at Washington Hills for finding something better. What about uh, this? Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, the Bible says, Jeremiah, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the what paths? The old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But then there's the last statement that I wish wasn't in there, the last sentence. But they said, nah, I don't like that way. That's the old path. I'm not going to walk there. That's old folks. I'm not going to wear that tie. That's too old. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the old past, we don't like old things. But, you know, I think according to this scripture, we have to recognize that there's some things that are like lasting. That there is some value in anchoring yourself in some solid biblical tradition. Do you think that's true? of anchoring yourselves in things that have proved true for Christians for centuries. Not necessarily something new and fangled and always exciting, but something that is like Christians throughout the, they have given their life from this. There is something here that I can hang my life on. If they had it, I want it too. And it's not just a flight of feeling. 
It's an experience with God. And so there's something about old things necessarily that we can at least value. And this is another thing that we value here at Washita Hills. There is an era of hymnody or Christian hymn writing called the Golden Age of Hymns. You know, there's always been Christian hymns. Early back to the early sanctions, uh, I, don't, I don't know who said it, and I was trying to find the quote, and I could not find it, and I'm beginning to question my mind if I ever remember it. I'm sure I would find it on the internet, and I looked for it, and I just couldn't find it. But the quote I remember is that the Christian religion has produced more music than all the other religions combined. But I couldn't find it, so I shouldn't have said it probably. <laughs> And I don't know where it came from, and I don't know how anybody would ever calculate that, but I know it's true that the Christian religion has produced an enormous repertoire of music and songs. And, because when you know Christ, you have something to sing about. There's joy. And so there is an age of this golden age of hymns, and it came and it fell between 1700 and 1900 roughly. Um, it began, um, it was called this hymn explosion where before this time period, they had just a few hand uh, like song books and other things. They was just kind of, the Protestant Reformation came, right? Boom. And before that time, there wasn't much. But after the Protestant Reformation, it fueled this new age of hymn growth. And then it was like this, boom, they had hundreds and hundreds of hymnals all over the place that took place. And some of the great hymn writers, um, the father of English hymnody, Isaac Watts, that he lived from 1674 to 17. Uh, 48, and he, he wrote like 750 hymns. And then we have um, the Charles Wesley, who perhaps was the most prolific hymn writer, lived in the 1700s, and he wrote something like 9,000 hymns. A, a new hymn every day or two, he would write. The people were crying for them, and he was a pastor, and he started writing these hymns. And the thing about these, these hymns in many ways, is that they were, they're, they're based on solid biblical teachings that were founded in the Protestant Reformation movement that came out, that they, that they were just rich in, in solid teachings. And then, of course, in, more, in the 1800s, you have Fanny Crosby. Uh, these are some of the great hymn writers that um, at least are well known. In 18, uh, lived in the 1800s, and then uh, she had over 8,000 hymns that she penned being blind herself. Now, I think there is at least some benefit, at least as I look at it, to this golden age of hymns. And one of the things we value here at Washington Hills is some of these old hymns. I mean, some people, see, some people say young people don't like to sing hymns. And I was like, well, they haven't been to Washington Hills yet. <laughs> Friday night, you come here and we'll sing about 30 minutes. And boy, if when you take volunteers at least half the hands go up. <laughs> Everybody wants to select the next hymn because they have your favorite hymn and it's exciting. And boy, when you start singing, there's like, ooh, there's gusto there because those, those hymns have meaning and depth and they can be our own personal experience, a song of our hearts. And so this golden age of hymns, we appreciate and value that here. And it's not that new is necessarily bad or different or good, but, I mean, indifferent, but there's something there that Christians throughout time have found benefit by. Does that make sense? It is solid. What are some of the things that make these so important? Perhaps it's because they're birthed out of the Protestant Reformation, and we are Protestants, and there are few Protestants left in the world. Is that true? There's ecumenicalism, which everybody does their... But few that are protesting, they're going back. And, and by the way, the CCM music came out of what church? Carl? The charismatic movement came out of what church originally? After Vatican II. If I understood what you said me, told me the other day, right? It started with Catholicism. And, and the harmony going, many of them going back to what is going on in, in Catholic. So there's hardly any Protestants left, if I, understand, if I understand it. It's based on the idea of sola scriptura that came out of the Protestant, that they're teaching the Bible and the Bible only in, in these. And the primary purpose is teaching and demonstrating. And that's what scripture says that songs are to be in the New Testament in Ephesians. It says, teaching and admonishing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs and giving grace 
praise, uh, what is it, in your hearts to the Lord, I think it says. And the primary purpose of this, you know, with the Protestant Reformation, when it came into be, it, it was a teaching movement that was teaching the people and bringing them along with truth because they were ignorant. And these hymns, they found there was no better method of really teaching the people than to write a hymn about it, and they would sing it, and they would learn the truths. And so they're filled with truth. It's not, the, the, the emphasis of the music wasn't so much praise and worship as in, you know, like, I praise you, Lord, I praise you, Lord. You say that five times and then you sing something else. Um, it's more teaching truth filled and impressing that truth upon our heart. And so there's a, there's a benefit there founded on solid musical components in terms of harmony and melody. Now, this is because it came right after the, on the heels of the, of the Baroque period, the, the, uh, which was the, um, the Renaissance and then the classical period with Bach and so forth that has this components of solid musical composition. And the hymns are based along that same. It's not a eclectic and jazz and rock and other forms of mar more modern music that has a different origin. And so there is just some solidity. Can you see the old paths that have some benefit? And Maybe this is one of the reasons or some of the reasons why we appreciate hymns in particular here at Washita Hills, and we want to encourage those. So we have this golden age, and then they, then they have two other points. They have a strong singability. These hymns, many of them, not all. Sometimes you counter a hymn that you just can't sing very well, and they just fade out of the hymnal. We hardly ever sing them, you know. But, but some songs, they're just like Blessed Assurance, one of the most, her, Fanny Crosby's most famous hymn. I mean, it, it, it's so singable. And a lot of the hymns, they have that, and so we, we fall in love with them. And they're effective means of, of communicating Christian doctrine. We talked about that. Um, Oh, there's some others. Effective means of Christian living, of encouraging Christian living uh, together. And the best, uh, it's time beloved. These songs are, uh, they've been beloved for many tongues. So much time. So we have very much that um, we are, this age is, is thing, things, things that uh, we can appreciate and we enjoy. Now, at Washington Hills, uh, there will be at times when we have this new song, and I wanted to go over just a few things that we try to avoid. Those are things that we try to emphasize and encourage here. What are some things that we try to avoid here as a school? Um, and again, we're aiming high, right? Corporate worship we're talking about, not necessarily your private play, whatever, but that we're talking about upfront special musics and, and, and those sort of things, and we're aiming high. We're not going to try to settle for just these questionable. We want to be clearly what we could say, you know, that's where we ought to, that's where we can have confidence that God would have us uh, to be and more acceptable by, by everybody perhaps. So what are some of the things that we would avoid, avoid first is the beat. Now I want to ask you, why would we avoid beat? I want some feedback. Why would we want to discourage the beat in, in, all music has meter, and I, this is not a, a seminar going to go over these in detail. I'm just going to list some of the things we try to discourage and avoid. Why, though, do you think we would try to discourage this? As in syncopation. This is syncopation. A syncopated beat is emphasizing unaccented syllables or skipping syllables that should be accented. That's de-emphasizing them. Yes? More like a dance style. There's dances. Um, okay, good. Anything else? The beat is more physical in our response, and it does increase the lower passions. It's prevalent in the world, and we're trying to aim at something that's something better and not just common with the world. And so we want to stay away from and try to shy away from things that are excessively syncopated or uh, have a repeated syncopation and excessive beat. Does that make sense? And... It's just what we want to aim at, okay? What about CWM, songs that are primarily from the, the contemporary Christian music genre or artists? Now, this is a little bit difficult. There's music there that's nice, but as a whole, we, we shy away from or tend to want to stay away from because they don't, number one, understand the principles of perhaps godly music, they don't understand the truths for God's time of a remnant people that are not wandering after the world and his, the beast and the image and the mark of his name. And they don't understand, it's not based on the same 
foundational truths, and there's other issues with it that can be, but not all songs this are the same. But rather than try to judge and pick and choose, we try to shy away from it and try to hit something better. Try to stay away from association with what is just popular out there, but the trouble is most of many of us grew up with it, and those are the sounds that we like, those are the things that we are used to, and when we have an opportunity for special music, you know what we want to do? That's what we want to do, because that's what's, well, it's what's popular out there. Well, we want to try to find something better, some of those old hymns, something new, something that is, is still there, uh, that has depth. Um, there's other ways of looking at the reasons why, but that's what we try to encourage here. Excessive vocal ornamentation. By this, I mean scoops, slides, riffs, vamps, and hooks. Anyone know what those are? <laughs> Some, okay. What is a scoop? Ah, you come up to the note. Yeah. Or a slide, instead of when you're in singing in particular, as trombones have slides all over the place, or can anyway. They don't actually in the music unless it's written in there. <laughs> They're supposed to hit it. But, uh, but slides in music, when people are singing, they, they I, I tell this story because I was, singing in, I was singing in the men's chorus at Andrews in the seminary, and they had a men's uh, seminary chorus. And one of the persons had a, he was a, a, a man of culture, in other words, he was of a different culture than I was, but, um, and we were singing this song that had a solo for his part, and he was going to sing it. And when he came to sing his part, everybody was sitting in the audience, and we, they were singing, we were all singing, and he started singing, and as soon as he started singing, there was an instant change that came over the audience. It was like, yeah, oh, and they started going, it was like, whoa, I was like, what happened? Because when he started, he wasn't just singing the words. He was going all over the place, oh, oh, and he was sliding around, and it was a cultural phenomena that took place. It wasn't the words, and it wasn't this message, and it, it was something that happened from the sound that he was doing, not what the message and the music was. And, you know, we want to discourage a lot of... Why do we discourage this? Because this often sounds like what you would hear just out there. And it's what we find as we want to aim at something better and something better at least as we interpret it and try to encourage it is to play something that the people are going to come away with the message and not the performance you understand that and some of these things can get so much into people say wow that was a and sometimes a voice can be so beautiful that you can't hear the message is that true I don't know. For me, I mean, it's like sometimes you could get wrapped up. Wow, what an incredible voice. Like, who's the one that sings? You raise me up. What's the name? Groban. Josh Groban. I think that's him. Man, that Italian alto or whatever ten, tenor. Whoa, I mean, it just, it just like, whoa, blows you away, right? You can hear a voice and be so wrapped up in the, in the production and the sound that you miss the message. And music should convey a message and enable us to come into God's presence, not into the presence of the singer. And that's what some of these can do. They can emphasize the music and the performance rather than, and if you just hit and sing and try to get, convey the message with a heart, that's what is important. And that's what we want to try to encourage. Does that make sense? And what is a riff? Riffs, vamps, and hooks are all similar things. These are repeated chordal pattern, patterns in the song, and it's a rep repetition that are very popular in CCM music, where it kind of goes, uh, this humorous, I saw this humorous um, thing on how to make a praise song, and he was just, he was doing a parody on it. Somebody told me about that, I think. I mean, he was doing a parody on it, and you have these four chords, and you just go, dum, 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 and then you add these words, and then you just do that over again and over again about 20 times, and then you, I mean, it was just, that's not all music that's 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 by the ways you know it's just in excessive but we want to stay away from those things because we want to encourage something better okay those are some these are some some kind of specifics and uh there's some other things if i can get this to work it's freezing up need Mr. <laughs> him to come, Mr. Smith to come back and help me out again. 
I don't know what that happened is. Excessive beats. Oh, that's what we just went over, right? But why won't it go to the next slide? There we go. Okay, uh, some more things. The essential style. There is a common sound in much of worship, and it's done because of instru- I mean, uh, microphones. You can't do it, basically, if you didn't have microphones. But because of amplifications, we are allowed to do it in mass now. And it has to do with this breathy whisper and the little slurs of the language when it's being sung. And, you know, how are you? And what does it sound like? It has this intimate whisper in your ear experience. Now, some people will say, what's wrong with that when you're talking about God? You're getting intimate with God. He's not a lover. <laughs> and the problem is that many times you can take that, if you could just think about somebody else, you could think about the song wouldn't be referring to God at all right? And there's this crossover song, but that's another topic. But we want to say, and by the way, it has the sound of the nightclub. And we want to stay away. And so when, when we're singing up front, we want to stay away from those sounds that bring us reminiscent of the things that are of the world. And breathy whisper these slurs we want to try to stick, stay away from. Harmonic treatment saturated with dissonant sonorities, which is like ninths and elevenths and thirteenths and uh, and things that are dissonant or um, that are like augmented or diminished chords that are full of that. This is jazz sounding. It's because it has a different genre and we want to try to stay away from those. We have something better. Display, self-centered and attracting attention. Um, We should uh, make sure that our sounds are performances for God. Let me just go over some things we can encourage and want to encourage, and that is authentic, personal. Things that, music that is authentic and personal, that is word-centered, focuses on the Bible, that is truth-filled, clearly Christian and biblical. When a person gets done, people shouldn't say, you know, was that a Christian song? And I've had that experience in church. I got done with listening to special music, and I thought, hmm, I don't even think they mentioned about Jesus or God once in that song. And you could have been thinking about anybody or anything. And what was, the, what was the truth that was communicated? What experience was it? And so we want to have make sure it's filled, truth-filled and it's heartfelt, full of the Holy Spirit, that is live music. Now, by this, we discourage canned music at Washington Hills. That means music that you would have a CD as accompaniment. Now, it's not the accompaniment's wrong or bad. Why would we encourage live music? Any questions? Any thoughts on that? Pardon? We have the talent, okay, <laughs> why not use it? Better use it than, any other reasons? It's personal. It's more authentic. It's us doing it, not somebody else doing it for us. It can be controlled. Can be controlled. <laughs> we don't know necessarily what's coming in. Uh, there can be often is, but not always, um, in, in some can music issues with beats that we have and other things that come in, and we've had those in the past. and. One of the reasons, though, is because we want it to be genuine. And a heart, even a, an imperfectly played piece on the piano could touch a heart more than this grand production. Does that make sense? That a personal experience, genuinely performed with a heart that loves God, we think may have more benefit to us than something that is driven by a CD. And you are stuck to follow what is there, but if the Holy Spirit wants to move and change the music and adapt as you're going, you can't do that with a CD. And so there's limitations. It's not that there's bad, but this is what we encourage. We try to encourage live music, and we want prayer back music, that you're going to pray about those special musics before you come up here and share. And I think those are safe guidelines That's all we have time for. I'm not going to finish the presentation. We'd be another half hour, and I'm already over. So um, um, does that make sense? These are things that we really want to encourage, things that we discourage, and we want to aim at something better. Do you know there is a devil out there, as we went over this morning, and he has his crosshairs on you, young people. And wherever the, we are told, wherever the, the devil, wherever God has a work, 
happening and young people are being trained to work for him, the devil's going to work with, especially there. And he does it through the most alluring way, and that's through music. I have to gauge my own life and say, you know, what are my values? What have I, and I've been through a little journey in my own life when it comes to music, and I finally came to the point where it's like, you know, that's not bad music, and I hardly ever listened to it. We have all these CDs there, and we hardly ever listen to it. It's all good music, it's classical music, Baroque and stuff, but we hardly ever listen because I decided in my life finally, I really want to just choose that which is going to help me. Not just be good music, but help me spiritually. And I'll tell you that if you want to know some sources, there are a few good sources out there, the least that I've found, that are just incredible music. And that is um, Majesty Music and uh, Soundforth. If you don't know, look up those two. And if you want to get some incredible music, there's other ones out there, but it's just the music, the message, the truths, and it's, it's uplifting. And that's about all we ever play. Once I, I got married, my wife, that's what she enjoyed, and she had a bunch of CDs, and that's about all we all ever play is songs of that nature that when we listen to them, they do something for us spiritually. Not just, oh, wow, that was a good song. And this is what we want to encourage. We want to encourage something that is high, that is like, wow, let's aim for that which we can say, I really, it's not a gray area. It's not, it's not necessarily even the good, but it's the best as far as what we can ascertain from our experience and our study and, and, and history. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and you shall find rest for your souls. Let's kneel together. And when we're done, we'll just have a few moments of quiet prayer before we sing our song. Father in heaven, thank you that you've given us this incredible gift of music, and we have this capacity to appreciate it, to enjoy it. It has incredible power in our lives. It's pervasive in our culture, and it is also very we are told, used by the enemy to pervert us. And we have a choice in our own life to evaluate that which comes into our ears, to choose that which we share with others when we come up front and how we share it. And I pray that this year, Father, you would help us to aim high personally, corporately, and that you would help us to defeat the attack of the enemy through this most alluring and tempting agency. And I pray, Father, that you would work mightily this year, that we would have godly music and that we would glorify you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.